Well, good morning once again, and thank you for joining me today as we continue to take our snapshots through the journey in numbers. But today there's a photograph, I suppose, if you take a snapshot of this chapter, and we're going to chapter 31 today, and we're skipping over chapter 30. It's a, it's a snapshot that I think most of us would find hard to take. It's one of those passages in the Bible that describes how God commands the nation of Israel to execute judgment upon another nation. It involves the death of men, women and children, even livestock. It's often been used as one of those chapters to accuse God of being unjust and some people use it as a reason for rejecting God altogether. Many from an atheistic community will cite sections of the Bible like this as a, a good example of how God is just a great tyrant. And yet, when we start to look at this passage, I think it needs that more thoughtful and more uh, quiet, serious consideration. Yes, of course, that is the truth, that here is a situation God commands and Moses to do something, he says in verse 2, avenge the people of Israel on the Midianites, and then afterwards you shall be gathered to your people. And so what happens is that um, Moses, he gets a thousand men from each of the twelve tribes, they form an army, they go and they kill all of the male people. Verse 7, they warred against Midian as the Lord commanded and killed every male, they killed the kings, and the people took captive a number of others. And then, of course, then they are commanded to kill even some of those, the women. Uh, not the young girls, but the women. And uh, this, when you read it, immediately, you know, your thought is, oh, this is really, this is a hard picture to watch. This is painful and difficult. One of the things I want to say is that sometimes it's not easy to find an answer that satisfies every single question maybe that people have or every single criticism. And in fact, there are seldom answers like that for any situation in life because there are always things that we don't know. We know so much, but then there's another part we don't. And this is true every single day of our lives. We may know all the facts about a case, but we don't know what people think in their minds. We don't know other tiny aspects that may have had a very significant bearing upon their final decision. And so with that in mind, I'm going to offer you a few explanations or a few thoughts on this, because that's what they are, to allow you and I to think about it, read it through again, and pray it into our lives. First of all, I'm going to ask you a question. How seriously do you and I take sin? How seriously does our nation take sin? I think the answer might be very selectively. You could list the sins from the greatest to the least, and you could ask other people to do the same. You could ask different nations to do that, and you'll get a very different list but I think you will get a list nonetheless. The list changes from time to time. And then you would say to yourself, or I would say, now what will you do to those who are at the top of the list? And you'd be interested to see what will happen. If we could go back all the way to, uh, back into the Second World War, which we we're looking at as we we're looking through the story of Corrie ten Boom, which kind of deals with the same question from another perspective, and you can tune into that this evening at after six. But take the situation of the Holocaust and what's happening to the Jews. Now, there's a sin, genocide there. There's a sin of that. Now, what would you say we would do to those people? Would we just simply say, now, naughty boys, you mustn't do that. We'll put you in prison for a couple of years, and then we'll sort of let you all go free. That's certainly not, that was not the response of any of the people at that time. They had the Nuremberg trials, and many people were executed. They were executed. I don't think there are many people around that time who said, this is, um, this is a bad thing. We totally disagree with this. That's not to say they found it pleasant. 
I'm sure they'd find it anything but pleasant. But they knew, I think, in their hearts, this is a sin that requires being dealt with seriously. Now, if you and I were then to ask God, what is your list of greatest sins? I wonder what you think he would say. When I go to the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God given for all mankind, written in human hearts, so that people know, and they're without excuse in that sense, God says the very first commandment is that you shall have no other gods, that I am to be Lord, to worship the Lord your God. I think the greatest sin is the rejection of God and his place, the rejection of his Holy Spirit's gracious work in our hearts so that it's called the unforgivable sin. That means by rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be forgiven because you need to receive that work in order to enter into that spirit of forgiveness. You see, I think you have to think differently. When we come to the Bible, we're asked to think Christianly. We're asked to think along God's thoughts. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His thoughts are perfect. When we think, we think with fallen minds. We think with minds that are tainted with sin. And that affects the way we see things. By the grace of God, our hearts are changed and we start to see things differently. And, differently, and that's what we're trying to do now. So that's the first question. How seriously do we take sin and what do we think are the greatest sins and how does God see things? Then secondly, consider the guilt of the Midianites, the people who are here to be judged. The Midianites, according to the, the understanding of the, of the first five books of the Bible, we understand them as part of this society that has really fallen and dipped into a cycle of evil and idolatry and excessive immorality. And it's like a disease. It's the only way I can describe it. It's like a disease. And if we allow the disease that is going rampant across these nations at this time to, to continue to grow and expand, what will it do? It will destroy the very core of society itself. There'll be nothing left. God chooses to execute his justice and judgment. The purity of the nation of Israel is crucial to the salvation of of billions of people in the universe, in the world. Now, ultimately, God will judge every person. The Bible tells us that after death comes the judgment. That judgment will be fair and pure, and not one of us would be able to say anything about it except that God is doing what's right. Now, we might be happier if this judgment was executed with plague or fire or earthquake, and it didn't require any human being involved in it. I have no answer for that. One of my thoughts in this regard is, well, maybe God is using the people of Israel to show them by putting them in that place how horrific sin is. So like a kind of a vaccination against it, they will be able to be inoculated against its worst its worst effects for later on, for your good and my good and the good of all. Now, the Israelites were not being used because they were better. Of course, we have to remember that. In Deuteronomy 9, it says, I didn't choose you because of your righteousness. No, God chose because God chose. Later on, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk the prophet, when he's dealing with a similar problem, he says, look, how come you're using this sinful nation of Babylon to judge this nation of Israel? Just the reverse. I mean, when, okay, God was using Israel now, but then later on he was using Babylon to judge Israel. And God said, don't you worry about that. He said, I'm going to judge them too. I think we must rest in this knowledge that God can be trusted to deal in absolute fairness with all of the innocents in this matter. All I would say is that if an innocent was spared the exposure to a world of violence and corruption and immorality, that child would be blessed indeed. There is no question about it. And I'm sure there are many people in our day who would say if they could choose, oh Lord, take me home out of this misery and this evil world. Is that not a, what is wrong with that prayer? The Apostle Paul himself prayed, to depart and be with Christ was far better. 
Well, isn't it one of those times that really humbles us? We look at these passages. Well, they anger some people, but when you stop and think about it, they really ought to humble us. So that we then realize maybe we're judging matters in the very wrong way. We're placing ourselves in the position of God, the God who says his ways are beyond tracing out. And then maybe as I conclude, just need to mention this, that I think we always have to evaluate not just these types of situations, but every situation in the shadow of the cross. Because in that shadow, as it, as it, as it were, casts its light in another way over everything, it tells us how God deals with sin in its essence. There we see God's justice, absolutely. But there we see God's love. That's what we see, perfect love and perfect justice. And God is demonstrating his love for us in this way. So as we look down through the annals of history and we see these incidents, and you have to also bear in mind in Scripture, they are very rare. They are very specific. They are very directed. We have to look at them in the light of the cross in Christ's death. And we also have to look at them in the light of our own personal sin. This is a day of grace. And even these Midianites lived in the environment of observing God's grace. And when some of them, like Rahab, among that world were to turn in faith, God welcomed them. He would not have turned anyone away, it seems. We see that on many occasions in the Old Testament. But this day of grace is for you and I. Don't let our judgment of some things we think God did hinder us from thinking about the judgment that we deserve from God. And that unless we are running to the cross of Christ and finding ourselves hidden in him, trusting in what he's done, it will be there for us. For we will have no other, no other for there is only, un, only one way out. And it's through Jesus Christ and his blood shed for us. And so today I would pray that you and I would take our sin seriously, thank God wondrously for the cross that has dealt with it. And if we have not yet turned to that cross, oh, all I can say to you is, do not waste one more precious second of your life until you embrace God's mercy through Christ. Father, I pray for all of us who are now listening that in these times which are sobering times, they shall speak to us of even more sobering things and bring to us these profound realities of God's sovereign, just and gracious and that we will find ourselves experiencing his mercy and his love. O oh Lord, open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, and be praised and watch over us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.